in the last part of this playlist talked all about looping. This chapter will mainly cover how to work with cursor objects while writing anonymous blocks or stored procedures using Snowflake SQL scripting. We will not just learn the SQL construct but also take different examples and understand how to debug in case of syntax error kind of error messages thrown when we try to execute incorrect cursor statements. So stay tuned until the end of this video to gain a comprehensive understanding while working with cursor. We have already covered many important concepts in this playlist. If you haven't seen these chapters yet, please watch it after completing this video. The link for all the videos are available in the description section below. Alternatively, you can also visit my Medium blog page to find the sample SQL script used in this tutorial. This video will concentrate on a cursor object concept in the context of Snowflake stored procedures or anonymous blog and cover the topic listed here. So let's jump to our Snow site and see all of them in action. And please remember to hit the like button if you have been benefiting from my content and if it is contributing value to your Snowflake learning journey. Welcome to my channel Data Engineering Simplified. For all my demonstration, I will be utilizing the free trial edition of Snowflake on AWS. Make sure to adjust the video quality to 4K since all my recordings are in that resolution. To speed up your learning process, consider increasing the playback speed to 1.25x or 1.5x. For direct communication, feel free to message me on my Instagram account or join my exclusive Facebook group. If you are interested in systematically enhancing your Snowflake skill, check out my premium Udemy courses. So this is our Snowflake SnowSite web UI and this is my first worksheet called Cursor Construct. Before I demonstrate how the cursor works in Snowflake via anonymous block or stored procedures, let's create a table called Employee Table. Employee table has a couple of standard columns like ID, first name, last name, date of joining, destination, department code, and whether this employee is a manager or not. I am going to insert 10 employees where few of the employees are having the manager flag equals to true and some of the employees are having manager flag equals to false. My employee table is created successfully. Now let's insert this first 10 records. Now let's say if I need to find out total number of managers in the employee table, generally I can run a command like this, select count from employee where is manager flag equals to yes. And this gives total four count, looks good. Now let's try to run this query and try to access this value through a cursor. And this is my anonymous block and let's understand what this anonymous block is doing and how we are using the cursor variable. So this is my declare block which declare all the global variables. So we are declaring a manager count of data type number with a default value 0. And on the line number 44 I have defined another variable called my cursor and the type of this variable is a cursor type. Here I have used a keyword called for and after that this is my select statement where this cursor is actually holding the result of this query. So the primary purpose of a cursor object is to hold the result of a query and then you can access the individual row or you can also iterate through the cursor, perform different kind of operations which we are going to see later part of this video. So during the declaration, the query is not executed and to execute the query, I have to open the cursor. So if you look into the line number 47, I have used a keyword open followed by the cursor variable which is matching with this and once this open followed by cursor name is executed, your query is actually executed using the virtual warehouse. Now once this query is executed and result is associated with my cursor variable, you can use a keyword called fetch and using this keyword you can actually access the individual row from your cursor object. And this is how the syntax looks like, fetch followed by name of your cursor into the manager count because we know that it is fetching only one single value and this manager count is nothing but it is coming from this global variable and the result of this cursor for the first row will be stored here. Once this is done, I close the cursor and then return the manager count. Now let me execute this 
anonymous block and see how the result looks like. And data type is number. And if I go back to my query history, let's see how does it look like. So this is my insert statement. This is my select count statement, which I ran independently. This is my anonymous block. And the query execution as a part of a cursor is registered as a separate query. So this is a very simple example. And the use of cursor is not really required for our use case. And this can also be done via different mechanism. So for example, I can define a manager count and directly associate select count into this variable. And this will also serve the purpose because it is fetching a single record. Likewise, I can also use this colon followed by equal to operator, or I can define a local variable inside this begin block and achieve the same result. So there are multiple ways to solve the same problem if as far as this use case is concerned. Now let's extend the same use case and what if I get the multiple result from my query, how would I iterate my cursor rather than using the fetch keyword. So if you look into this example, here this is my declare block and here I am not applying a filter criteria, neither I am applying an aggregated function called count. So the query is select a star from employee table and it will return total 10 record. Now here I have defined another variable called employee status and then I open the cursor and now if you look into the line number 79 to line number 84, here I am using a for loop. So in the for loop, actually this cursor is treated more like a list object if you're coming from a programming background. And once I fetch the individual row item from this cursor, I can use this dot notation followed by name of the column, which is part of my result, and then fetch the employee status. So here, if you look, row item dot is manager which is nothing but one of the column and being stored into this local variable called emp underscore status if emp underscore status is equals to yes then manager count is incremented by one and if not it will skip this if condition and that is how i increase the total manager count and get exactly the same result what we have got from the query now let's execute this block and see how this cursor construct work using a for loop so I got exactly the same result. And if I go back to my query history, so this is my anonymous block where I have this for loop and this is my select star from employee. So we have seen other loops like while loop and repeat loop in our previous chapter. However, while loop and repeat loop don't have direct support for a cursor object. And if you have to iterate a cursor object, you have to use the for loop. So if I have to summarize, when I open a cursor, this particular query is executed and this query brings this particular result. And when I say fetch my cursor into this MGR count, this particular value is being finally stored into this variable because this is my first row. And when I run this approach to where my query is select star from employee, and this is how the result appear where I have total employees starting from employee 1 to employee 10 and when I execute this for loop with my cursor every time I try to call this row item dot is manager this is the cursor position and it will fetch this result in the next iteration it actually goes to this and fetch this result and that is how it moves forward and fetching the values from each row and if I call the fetch twice or thrice the fetch will start from here and then fetch will move to here and my third fetch will move to this point and that is how fetch allows you to handle one row at a time this is how the cursor works with fetch as well as for loop we have seen how to use cursor object through anonymous block and we know the same anonymous block can be converted into a stored procedure so here we are creating a, a stored procedure called manager count and return type is a text that should be a number and then language is SQL and here I have copied pasted the entire block. So let me create this stored proc. So my procedure got created successfully. Now let's call this procedure which will open this cursor and fetch the total manager count. So here I got my result 4. If I go back to my query history, so this is the creation of my stored procedure 
this is the call of the stored procedures and here is your sql query which is part of your cursor now by looking at this query it is hard to understand whether this query is part of this stored procedures or part of something else and that would be one of the challenge you may have it when you are debugging and trying to understand which query is executed as a part of a stored procedures and which query is executed outside of the stored procedures This is my next worksheet called local versus global variable cursor and here we will try to understand whether we can define a cursor inside a declare block or we can also define a cursor within my begin and end block as a local variable. If you look into this anonymous block, this anonymous block does not have a declare section. It is creating a my cursor variable within my begin and end block and this is going to be a local variable. And and there is no change in the logic. Let's execute and validate the result. So the result is same. I have total four managers in my employee table. Now this is my another anonymous block where I have defined a global cursor called my cursor inside my declare block and I am defining same variable inside my begin and end block. Now if I try to do this, let's see what happens. So this ends with an error and it says my cursor declared twice. We have already understood how the global and local variable works in our earlier chapter. And if you haven't watched that particular video, I would request you to go and watch it. Now this is my third worksheet called 03. Let's debug it. And in this worksheet, we are trying to play with this cursor variable and see what kind of error messages are thrown if we end up making a mistake during our development activity. So again, this is my anonymous block where I'm defining a local variable, opening the cursor, using the fetch keyword to get the value, closing the cursor and finally returning the result. So let's say what happens if I do not open a cursor and try to execute this anonymous block. It ends with this error saying that my cursor variable is not open. So after declaring a cursor, it has to open because when you open a cursor, then only this particular SQL statement will be executed. Now, what if I do not fetch anything and simply close a cursor? Does it complain? So I have commented this line number 11 where the fetch keyword is used to get the value from the cursor. Now, let me re-execute this anonymous block after commenting it. So I got the default value zero in the sense it is not necessary that you have to use fetch or for keyword to iterate through the cursor and fetch the value. Now let me uncomment this. Now if you look into this particular query, it fetches only one row. But what if I try to use the fetch twice or maybe thrice? Let's see what happens. So it has resulted null value. So even though your cursor does not have any available row item, it will try to continue. It doesn't end with an error and it simply return a null result. So this is an important thing. This can be inferred two ways that either you do not have any row item in your cursor or the value which you are trying to fetch from the row item is null. And that could lead to a confusion while doing the development activities. Now let's simulate another scenario. So in the line number 14, I am closing the cursor and after closing the cursor, if I try to use the fetch keyword, let's see what happens. So here it again says my cursor is not open because you have to open the cursor and then only you can use it. So can I reopen the cursor? Now let me put this line here and let's rerun it. So yes, you can, after closing the cursor, you can reopen the cursor and every time you reopen the cursor, your query gets executed. And let's see whether this query gets executed twice or not. So if I go to the query history, so this is my block. Here, this is my first open and here, this is my second open. Good. Now, let's say that you have a very complex SQL and that SQL is not very appropriate. So before we really associate a SQL statement with a cursor, make sure that you validate the query. But what if I do not have this object available? Let's say that I give a wrong, wrong object name. Now let's execute this anonymous block. So it complains that uncaught exception type syntax error because when it is trying to execute the statement, it got object is either not available or not authorized. Okay, let me put it back and what if I remove this equals to sign? Let's see what happens. So it says unexpected y. Okay, 
and obviously line number seven this is a line number seven and by looking at this thing you can understand that any issues with your sql statement will be caught by snowflake and it, it will complain during the execution right. now let's talk about a data type mapping whenever we use a fetch keyword with the cursor and trying to put value inside a variable you need to make sure that you have used appropriate data type else sometime it may cause a problem okay so let's try to simulate that so let's say instead of i am removing this default and if i do not give a data type let's see what happens so it says that manager count must have either a type or initializer okay so this is important now if i give so in place of a number if i give text let's see what happens so it has returned the text type looks good instead of text if i give boolean so it has returned true because so it is a non zero value so it is true and what if i give variant so this has given a array or a variant type so this is how this fetch followed by into keyword works when you are trying to capture the result of a cursor into a variable here we are going to explore more in the next worksheet so while you are building your restore procedure using cursor please remember this behavior and accordingly build your business logic now this is my next worksheet called more about fetch keyword and we are going to go deeper for the fetch keyword and its behavior so if you look into this anonymous block we have defined three different variable called first name last name and designation and if you look into this select statement here also we have first name last name date of joining and designation it is basically returning four values and now i am opening a cursor here this is the line number 13 i am opening the cursor now let's remove this date of joining for now so if you look into this my cursor is having three different values and this three different values will get into this three variables one after another and then finally my return will be concatenation of first name last name and the designation let's execute this anonymous block and i got the result christine green payroll administrator looks good because i am just fetching it and what if i fetch it twice and let's run it now the second fetch has executed and it got the result james wilkinson java developer looks good now what if i have a date of joining here and i am not changing anything so in this case my first name will match with the first name last name will match with the last name and date of joining will match with the designation and as we have seen the data type matching behavior snowflake will try to cast the result of this into this variable and that is how your outcome will appear now let's execute this and understand the behavior so look i got a wrong result so while building a solution using a cursor you need to pay good attention now what happens if it does not fetch this two columns and let's see what result does it bring in that case the entire result has come null because we are using a concatenation but if i do not use the concatenation feature then let's see what happens semicolon is missing okay so i got that but what if i change this with designation let's see what result does it bring so it got null because here it is fetching two columns and here i have given three columns so snowflake will try to fill first name with first name last name with last name and there is nothing designation available in the cursor so it will keep this value empty or null now this is my another worksheet called cursor inside a loop and here we are trying to explore can i define another cursor inside a cursor and whether snowflake support this or not so this is my another anonymous block and here i am first opening a cursor with select star from employee and here i am defining an employee status here i am opening my first outer cursor and here on the line number 17 i am looping through the cursor using for keyword and this is my row item as individual row and i am fetching is manager flag if it is manager my count is increasing by 1 and then i am opening another cursor and this cursor is doing nothing i just wanted to see if i can open another cursor within a cursor or not and then i am opening a cursor and my loop is ending 
Now let's try to run this anonymous block and see whether this works or not. Yes, it has worked and if I would like to see the query profile, does it show something different? Let's go to the query profile and try to validate the query profile screen. So the query profile does not really show detail how this cursor and other statements are executed. And if I go back to the query history, Sir, I'm running a cursor inside a cursor. You can clearly see that the select star from employee where designation equals to solution architect is being repeated. However, the first query execution used a compute warehouse, but all other execution is actually coming from the result cache and it is not using the virtual warehouse. So Snowflake is smart enough to use the subsequent query from the result cache rather than using your compute warehouse. Looks now this is my another worksheet called result set and cursor. And in this worksheet, we are going to understand how to use result set object with cursor. So this is my same anonymous block. And here, if you look into the line number eight, I have defined a variable called RS of type result set. It is taking the result of a select state. We are going to cover the result set in a future chapter, but I just wanted to show how we can use result set with cursor. So once my result set is defined, I can attach this result set with this cursor. And after that, my logic for cursor will work as we have seen earlier. One important thing, if you look into this begin block, I am not opening the cursor because the cursor is directly associated with my result set. So here I'm using the for loop, which is operating on my cursor, iterating through each of the row item within the cursor, checking if it is manager, if yes, plus one, and if it is not manager, simply skip this if block and that's how this anonymous block is calculating total number of managers in your employee table let me execute this block so even though i am not using the open keyword for a cursor the cursor is automatically having the result using the result set object This is, so this is how you can associate a query result with a cursor, open a cursor that will execute your query, use the fetch keyword to fetch individual element, or you can also use the for loop to get the data from the cursor. I hope you got something valuable from this video. If you did, please hit the like button. Your support not only recognizes the work behind this free content, but also helps other to discover this playlist. And if you think it can help someone else in your team, feel free to share. Thanks for watching and let's spread the knowledge and growth together.